So I want to try to wrap up Return of the Queen. Uh, Return of the Queen. <laughs> Dog had surgery last week, and he had me up twice in the middle of the night to go outside to just walk around because it, it was a nice night. Um, so my brain's just fried. Um, and I want to pick up in chapter five, the steward and the king of the second half of Return of the King. Um, Frodo's already destroyed the ring. The battle outside the the um, Black Gate has been decided, and Tolkien takes us back with this chapter, The Steward and the King, and we see for much of it, Faramir and Eowyn in the Houses of Healing, or at least in the precincts of the Houses of Healing. The Houses of Healing is essentially like a little building, but then there's a garden attached to it. Okay, so I want to pick up with page 960, which is three to four pages into the chapter, okay? And Faramir and Eowyn find each other outside in this little garden area, and uh, actually I'm going to pick up with 959. Faramir asks Eowyn, what would you have me do, lady? I also am a prisoner of the healers. And he looks at her. He sees loveliness with grief. And he asks her again, what do you want? If it, not you, stupid. If it lies in my power... Loveliness with grief, any of circuit. Take a gander. Shut up. <laughs> if it lies within my power, he says, I'll do it. And she says... Tell the warden to let me go. Why? Because again, as she has said earlier to Aragorn, she's a shield maiden. Okay? Er, uh, Faramir says, top of 960. Can't do that. Why? I'm in his keeping too. In other words, he actually has say over me. He says, you know, we have to stay here until we receive our healing. She says, but I do not desire healing. I wish to ride, I wish to ride warlike, I wish to ride to war like my brother Aelmer, or better like Theoden the king. And notice what she means, better. For he died and has both honor and peace. See, that kind of reinforces the way I was suggesting we should read her comments to Aragorn about wanting to spend her life. Okay? She wants to die. Faramir says, too late, they've already left. Death and battle may come to us all yet, willing or unwilling. Remember the conversation with Aragorn? And he says, you know, but lady, your job is to stay here, etc. There may come a time when no warriors return from battle. When they left, what were they expecting? When Aragorn, Gandalf, Imrahil, all the other lords, and the approximately 10,000 rode off to the Black Gate of Mordor, what were they expecting? Yeah, to die. They were marching into a trap. They were simply trying to draw Sauron's eye out. Gandalf says, you know, we may die. There is a little teeny tiny bit of hope, okay? But not much. So what would the purpose of Faramir and Eowyn then be? If they're all dead. Okay, possibly. But what did Aragorn in that earlier conversation with Eowyn say? There may come a time when there won't be any stories. Why? Because you will be left behind and do what? Have to show greater valor knowing nobody's going to tell your story. Faramir is suggesting here we might just have to wait for Sauron to come obliterate us. You will be better prepared to face it in your own manner if, while there is still time, you do as the healer commanded. That is, you might be better prepared to face what's coming if you're at least healthy. <laughs> Maybe then you'll get a good swing in. She doesn't answer. 
But as he looks at her, it kind of looks like, you know, something softens. Maybe her shoulders just drop a little bit. We don't know. Okay? But what he does say, into the next paragraph, <clears throat> it would ease my care if you would speak to me or walk at wiles with me. How? How is that going to ease your care, she asks. I do not desire the speech of living men. Okay, you, you want my plain answer to be asked? <coughs> I would. Then, Eowyn of Rowan, I say to you that you are beautiful. In the valleys of our hills there are flowers fair and bright, and maidens fair still, but neither flower nor lady have I seen till now in Gondor, so lovely and so sorrowful. It may be that only a few days are left ere darkness falls upon the world. And when it comes, I hope to face it steadily. But it would ease my heart if, while the sun yet shines, I could see you still. In other words, all hell may be about to break loose, but it would make me feel just a little teeny bit better if I could at least look at you. <laughs> because you're beautiful. And to know there's still something of beauty in the world until it's all wiped out, that does what to Faramir at least? It encourages him. Think of what that word encourage means. This means Inside, it instills. What's courage? It's from the French. Cour, heart. Okay? It instills, it builds, it puffs his heart. It emboldens him. Okay? He says, for you and I have both passed under the wings of shadow. And the same hand drew us back under the wings of shadow. Yes, literally, that's the wings of the Nazgul, but he's also talking metaphorically. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay? That's the shadow Aragorn pulled them back from. Not me, she says. Shadow lies on me still. In other words, she's kind of seen through death-tinted lenses. Look not to me for healing. I am a shield maiden. My hand is ungentle. That is, don't look for, for uh, gentle pats on the back for me, fair mare. She's kind of telling him, suck it up, man. Be a warrior. <coughs> but she says, I do thank you for this, that I can walk out in the garden. Okay? He goes back to his... Room, he talks to her. Mary is sent to Faramir for one reason. Give me the dirt on Eowyn. Tell me everything you can about her. Okay? And he thought that he understood, this is page 961, and he thought that he understood now something of the grief and unrest of Eowyn of Rowan. And in the fair evening, Faramir and Mary walked in the garden, but she didn't come. What else probably does Mary tell Faramir. You know, when Aragorn was in the room, she kind of, what? Softened up a little bit. But the next morning, he goes out, and there she is, clad all in white and gleamed in the sun. He called to her. She came down. They walked on the grass together each day afterwise. After, they do likewise. The warden watches him. He feels good. His care is lightened. He's thinking, that's all they need, some sun, some gentle air. The fifth day came since the Lady Eowyn went first to Faramir. They stood now together once more upon the walls. No tidings had yet come. All hearts were darkened. The weather, too, was bright no longer. It's cold. Wind had sprung up in the night. All right. They're clad in heavy cloaks, we're told. Faramir had sent for this robe, the robe that... Eowyn is wearing, and had wrapped it about her. He thought that she looked fair and queenly indeed as she stood there. The mantle was wrought for his mother. Fenduilas of Amroth, who died untimely, untimely, and was to him but a memory of loveliness and days, far days, of his first grief, etc. Okay? She shivers, and we're told 962. What do you look for, Eowyn? In other words, why do you keep coming out here and looking towards the east? 
Does not the black gate lie yonder? And must he not now be come thither? It is seven days since he rode away. Seven days, Faramir says. But think not ill of me if I say to you, they have brought me these seven days a joy and a pain that I never thought to know. Joy to see you, but pain. Why? Because the fear and doubt of this evil time are grown dark indeed. Eowyn, I would not have this world end now or lose so soon what I have found. He's thinking, you're so close and the world's about to. She's like, huh? What do you mean lose what you have found? But she looked at him gravely. I know not what in these days you have found that you could lose. But come, let's not talk about it. Let's not talk at all. Let's just look out seemingly at coming death. Man, she could be a downer. <laughs> I stand upon some dreadful brink, and it is utterly dark in the abyss before my feet. But whether there is any light behind me, I cannot tell. She stands, she says, at an abyss. And she doesn't see any light ahead of her. Pitch black. And she doesn't know if there's any light behind her. <coughs> kind of lost, right? For I cannot turn yet. She can't turn means, means what? It's not to the left or to the right. It's she can't turn around. She can't go in the opposite direction. Why not? I wait for some stroke of doom. Fairmer, yes, we do. And it seemed to them, as they said no more, and it seemed to them as they stood upon the wall that the wind died and the light failed and the sun was bleared. And all sounds in the city or in the lands about were hushed. In other words, it seems like what? Time stops. She said... I wait for some stroke of doom. Neither wind, nor voice, nor bird call, nor rustle of leaf, nor their own breath could be heard. The very beating of their hearts was stilled. Time stops. Time halted. And as they stood so, their hands meet and clasp, though they are aware of it. They wait for no they know not what. Then presently it seemed to them that above the ridges of the distant mountains. What are the distant mountains? The mountains of Mordor. What happens behind those distant mountains? Another vast mountain of darkness rose, towering up like a wave that should engulf the world. In other words, some kind of shadow rises up and it looks like a tsunami, a tidal wave. It's going to come out and it's going to break over the mountains and just wash all over. Gondor and everything behind it. And there's lightning, and then there's an earthquake. Darkness coming, lightning, earthquake, sounds like <coughs> in the days, right? A sound like a sigh goes up from all the lands, and then the hearts beat. Fairmere, that reminds me of Numenor. Well, what happened to Numenor? You have to read the Silmarillion. Numenor, the Isle between Valinor, where the gods live, and Middle-earth, Numenor, also called Western Nessa, is where Aragorn's people ultimately come from. And what happens to it? Because of Sauron, it sinks into the sea. Because that's when the gods reshape Middle-earth. The reason it sinks is they're bringing down judgment upon it. Why? Because the men of Western Nessa, some of them, most of them, followed Sauron's Temptation. Okay? So he says, it reminds me of Numenor means, uh-oh, <laughs> we're about to be engulfed. She says, Numenor? Yes, of the land of Western Essa that foundered, and of the great dark wave climbing over the green lands and above the hills, and coming on darkness inescapable. I often dream of it. Then you think darkness is coming? That is, so you think that's it? That's the end? That's the beginning? Darkness unescapable? He says, no. That's, that's just a picture in mind. I don't know what's happening. But I think great evil 
has befallen, and we stand at the end of days. My heart says nay. Notice this. His mind tells him it's the end of the world. His heart says nope. He doesn't say what his heart says in contrast to that. What is his heart meant to mean here? Gut reaction tells him it's really just the opposite. He says, all my limbs are light, and a hope and joy are come to me that no reason can deny. <coughs> a eucatastrophe is what he's talking about. Eowyn, Eowyn, white lady of Rowan, in this hour, I do not believe that any darkness will endure. And he kisses her. And what happens? As they stood on the walls of the city of Gondor, a great, great wind rose and blew. Their hair mixes. You know, a little foreshadowing of whatever in the future. And people start to sing. And at the bottom of that page, 963. The days that followed were golden. Spring and summer joined, made revel. Mary was summoned and rode away with the wains that store, took the store of goods to Osgiliath, but Fairmere did not go. Why? For now, being healed, he took upon him his authority. That is, they know the West has won. They know Sauron is defeated. And the stewardship, he's waiting until Aragorn comes. Nor did, er nor did Eowyn go, even though Eomer said, send Eowyn. And Faramir wondered, hmm, wonder why she didn't go. And he asked her, about, uh, top of 964, why do you tarry here and not go to the <coughs> rejoicing in Carmallon beyond Ker Andros, where your brother awaits you? Do you not know? He goes, two reasons. Don't know which one it is. I do not wish to play at riddles. Speak plainer. So he says, you don't go because only your brother called for you, and you wish you were Aragorn calling for you one possibility, or because I do not go, and you desire still to be near me. And maybe both of these reasons you can't choose. Do you not love me, or will you not? Notice, do you not, that's now present tense, or might you not tomorrow, <laughs> or the next day, or I wished to be loved by another, she answered. But is it, I desire no man's pity. In other words, Faramir, don't love me just because I wanted to be loved by Aragorn and you're feeling pity for me. He says, I know. You desire to have the love of the Lord Aragorn. Why? Because he is I, Puissant, meaning powerful. And you wish to have renown and glory and to be lifted far above the mean things. In other words, you wanted to be queen. That's it. And as a great captain made to a young soldier, he seemed to you admirable. So he is. But when he gave you only understanding and pity, no love, what? Then you desired to have nothing but death in battle. If he wouldn't love you, you would kill yourself, essentially in battle. Close? <laughs> she says, Faramir says to her when she looks at him, Do not scorn pity that is the gift of a gentle heart, Eowyn, but I don't offer you my pity. For you are a lady high and valiant, have yourself one renown that shall not be forgotten. Yeah, I mean, she did what, after all? <coughs> she killed the witch king of Angmar, which people have been trying to do for thousands of years. It's, it's no little, you know, notch on your uh, sword hilt, I guess. And you are a lady beautiful, I deem, beyond even the words of the elven tongue to tell. And I love you. Once I pitied your sorrow. That is when I first met you, then I pitied you. Not anymore. Now, were you sorrowless, without fear or any lack, were you the blissful queen of Gondor? Still I would love you. Which would be kind of, you know, no, no, since if she were queen, there would probably be a king involved. Eowyn, do you not love me? Then the heart of Eowyn changed. Notice, it's seemingly instantaneous. 
or else at least she understood it. So it's either that it changes right then, or finally her mind and her heart get in sync together. Whereas before, she's been grinding the gears between them. And now she understands why it is she really stood or stayed. And suddenly her winter passed. <coughs> Notice how frequently before then she's described as cold. I stand in Minas Anor, the tower of the sun, she says. And behold, the shadow has departed. What shadow? Look at the next few lines. I will be a shield maiden no longer nor vie with the great writers, nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. It's that shadow. It's, it's partly the shadow of death. <laughs> but what else is it? Slaying and glory. She's saying the shadow of my previous mentality, which was all about what? What kind of people are the Rohirrim? I said before, they are Anglo-Saxon warriors. It's this that leaves her, this warrior-like mentality. Die getting glory. She says, I will no longer take joy only in the songs what, of slaying. These are heroic Poems, I will be a healer, which is just the opposite of this. So when she talked about standing at the abyss and not being able to turn around, what has she just done? She's made a 180. Okay. What is that called in quote-unquote religious circles? Or more specifically, let's say southern I don't want to throw a Baptist, but Southern, you know, American Christianity. Repent. It's what that word literally means. Turn around. Go in a different direction than you're going in now. Okay? She repents here. Of what? Of her former mentality. Her former mentality was, let me go to war. Why? So I can kill maybe be killed, and earn glory and fame. I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are not barren. No longer do I desire to be a queen. What else did she tell Aragorn? She said, I am a shield maiden and no what? Anybody remember? Serving woman. If you're going to be a healer, what must you do? If you're a doctor or you're a nurse, or physical therapist, what do you do to slash for your patients? You serve them. She has just exchanged mastery, control, for service. She's exchanged power for what? Humility. Okay? She's now going to humble herself. Before others. Because what does it really mean to be a healer? I mean, think about it. You go to the hospital. What has to be done every day for somebody who is bedridden? Okay? You might have to change their colonostomy bag. You might have to change their catheter bag. You might have to change their bed linens. <coughs> Not a pleasant job. So Faramir says, that is well, for I'm not a king. You marry me, you'll never be a queen. Yet I will wed with the white lady of Rowan, if it be her will. And if she will, then let us cross the river, and in happier days, let us dwell in Ferrothelion, and there make a garden. All things will grow with joy there, if the white lady comes. Okay? She says, so I must leave my own people? Was there no woman of the race of Numenor to choose? She asked Faramir. Why? Because he's also descended from the race of Numenor. Faramir says, I would. 
I would what? I would choose you. <laughs> All right? And so he says to the warden, here is the lady Eowyn of Rowan. And now she is healed. She wasn't healed before. She was healed how? I mean, she was, let's say, partially healed. How was she healed? Was she spiritually healed before? No, she is now. She was physically healed before. She didn't have any physical, physical thing wrong with her. But up here, or in here, yeah, she's still a lot wrong. But now, she's firing at all eight cylinders. She's working well, in other words. Okay? So, now we're going to skip a bunch. Uh, we're going to skip all the steward and the king stuff. You know, Aragorn gets crowned. We get many partings, chapter 6. Arwen, on page 974, gives Frodo her gift, okay, which is his ticket to the West. Um, the chapter goes on, and we see them ride north, and Aragorn and Arwen only go so far, and then the fellowship starts to break again. They arrive at Isengard, and what little surprise does um, Treebeard pull on Gandalf? I let Saruman go. Why? I don't like caging things up. He's like, okay, but he pulled a fast one on you. You think he didn't have any power, but he still had the power of his voice. Okay. And then page 984, 983, 84, they meet Saruman. And what do Frodo and Gandalf and Galadriel offer him? A second chance. Nine eighty three. Gandalf says, when they see him, "If you had waited, or think you would have seen him, that is the king, and he would have shown you wisdom and mercy. All more reason to have left sooner," says Saruman. Right. Gandalf says to him, when Saruman says, I'm seeking a way out of his realm, then once more, you are going the wrong way. What's Gandalf saying? Turn, Saruman. Go a different direction. You keep going in the wrong way, and what's going to happen to you? You're not going to get what you want, really. Okay? They offer Wormtongue an opportunity. Leave Sir Man. And he can't. Okay. 984. Sir Man says, You don't have a pipe, do you, with some tobacco? Frodo. I would if I had any. If I had some, I would give it to you. Okay. And what does Mary do? You can have what I have left. You can have what I have left. What does that mean? How much is Mary going to give him? All of it. All of it. He's giving Saruman everything in terms of the tobacco that he has. Okay? He's not just giving him a little. It's all. Okay? It came from the flotsam of Isengard. Notice, Saruman then says, well, then it's mine. It was mine to begin with. Right. Bottom of 984. They're talking about where the pipe weed and stuff came from. And Gandalf says, Alas for Saruman, I fear nothing more can be made of him. What did he say to Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli when they said, But you're all in white now? He says, Yes, I am white. Indeed, I am what? What Saruman should have been. In other words, Saruman should have become more than he was. Gandalf is saying, I don't think we can do anything else with Saruman. He is frozen, as it were. He's not going to, well, let's use the modern term, evolve. <laughs> He's not going to improve at all. What happened to Eowyn? She grew. She didn't stay frozen. Okay. 
He is withered altogether. All the same, I'm not sure that Treebeard is right. Okay? So they go on. And uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to skip a bunch again. They leave Bilbo at um, Rivendell, chapter 7, homeward bound. <coughs> they keep going on and they make their way to Bree and the Prancing Pony. They see Butterbur. Butterbur finds out that Strider is the new king and it kind of blows his socks off. In 996, they hear from Butterbur about doings in the Shire. Mary says, well, we've got you with us, Gandalf. Soon things will be cleared up. I am with you at present, he says. Soon I shall not be. I'm not coming to the Shire. You must settle its affairs yourselves. That is what you have been trained for. What's he mean? Or what does he suggest or imply there? Their little adventures of the last year have been for what purpose? To make them ready for what's about to happen. That Mary striking, you know, the captain of the nine. The Pippin falling under an orc uh, uh, mountain troll. All of that was part of the process of preparing them for taking back the Shire. Do you not yet understand? My time is over. It is no longer my task to set things to rights, nor to help folk to do so. In other words... It's time for you to set things to rights. And when they're dead, whose job will it be? The people who come after them. Remember Gandalf, the last debate, said, our job is what? To deal with the <coughs> ills or the evils of our time. Gandalf is saying, my time's done. Now it's your time. You are grown up now. Grown indeed very high. Both literally, Mary and Pippin, and metaphorically. Me, he says, I'm going to have a long talk with Bombadil. Such a talk as I have not had in all my time. He's had a lot of talks in the last several thousand years. He is a moss gatherer, and I've been a stone doomed to rolling. So, they go off to the Shire. And the Shire is not what it was when they left. I'm going to skip all the battles and stuff and get to the very end of that chapter. They finally arrive at Bag Inn. And who does, find, who does Frodo find living in his house? Sharky slash Sarah Man. They kick him out. <coughs> and Sarah Man says, bottom of 1018, Still, I've already done much that you will find it hard to mend or undo in your lives, and it will be pleasant to think of that and set it against my injuries. In other words, I went into your house and I totally trashed it. And while I'm wandering in the wastes, that will bring, bring some pleasure to my mind, knowing I've ruined much that had been beautiful. He's talking about not Frodo's literal own home, though that is involved, but the Shire. He cut down the party tree, he cut down other trees. He's uglified it, in other words. He's done what city planners kind of do, intentionally or not. Frodo, well, if that's what you find pleasure in, I pity you. Sarah Man finds pleasure in what? Destroying things. Other people's pain. So, they get ready to leave. The hobbits want to kill him. Frodo says, no. Why not? He says, it is useless to meet revenge with revenge. It will heal nothing. Sarah Man tries to stab Frodo. They stop him. Sam's getting ready to kill him. Again, Frodo says, no, Sam. Do not kill him even now, page 1019. For he has not hurt me. And in any case, I do not wish him to be slain in this evil mood. He was great once, of a noble kind that we should not dare to raise our hands against. He's saying, we're just little hobbits. It's, it's not in our job description to take care of former wizards. He is fallen, and his cure is beyond us. 
Okay, now notice those two words, fallen, cure. Fallen kind of implies he misstepped and he just needs help getting up. Cure implies what? He's ill. He's sick. So how do you reconcile ill and sick with fallen? Well, he's using fallen in the religious sense. He's not what he was made to be. Okay. Cure then implies <coughs> getting back to what he was made to be. He has fallen and his cure is beyond us. But I would still spare him. Why? In the hope that he may find it. Before Sarah man dies, Frodo hopes, he will find his cure. He will become essentially unfallen. Now, this is Tolkien's Catholic theology. Just hammering home. And Sarah man says, you've grown, Hal. Yes, you have grown very much because, notice, this is the second to the last chapter. Okay. And what is Frodo saying? Do not kill him. He does not deserve to die. What did Frodo say in the second chapter? Kill Gollum. He deserves death. Notice how Tolkien kind of matches those two. Paragraph, uh, chapters. You've robbed of my revenge of sweetness, and now I must go hence in bitterness in debt to your mercy. What is Shadow, what is Shadow from? What has Frodo shown in this scene? Pity and mercy. The two things he wasn't showing at all in the second chapter. So how much is Frodo grown? You are wise and cruel. Is he being cruel? Is Frodo going, oh, this will hurt. Yeah, this will be good. This is like bamboo shoots up the fingernails. No, he's not. He's being merciful, which Sarah Man takes as cruelty. Well, I will go, and I will trouble you no more, but do not expect me to wish you health and long, long life. You will have neither. He said, not my doing, I merely foretell. He goes, Wormtongue kills him, they kill Wormtongue. Notice what happens to Sarah Man's body when they kill him, when Wormtongue kills him. Do they have to dig a grave and bury him? Nope, because it turns to dust. And all that's left is the cloak. Wormtongue, however, being a mere human, they have to bury. Right. Chapter 9, Grey Havens. So Frodo lives at Bag Inn with Sam. Years go by, <laughs> and every year on two dates, Frodo kind of takes ill. One of those dates coming up is October 6th, and another one is March 25th. What happened on October 6th? Actually, it's the night. It's not March 25th. It's... Uh, this is when he was stabbed by the witch king of Angmar on Weathertop. Right? This is when he was bitten by Shelob. It's either the 10th or the 15th. Okay. So, a few years later, Frodo and Sam go for a ride in the forest. And they go off to the Grey Havens. <coughs> And page 1029. They meet up, a bunch of elves, Gildor, Elrond, Galadriel, Bilbo even. And Sam says, 1029, where are you going, master? Though at last he understood what was happening. To the havens, Sam, said Frodo. And I can't come? No, Sam, not yet anyway. Not further than the havens. That is, they ride all the way to the port. Though you too were a ring bearer, if only for a little while. Your time may come. Do not be too sad, Sam. You cannot be always torn in two. You will have to be one and whole for many years. Remember Eowyn. She was torn in two. Okay. 
That's this idea that Tolkien runs kind of throughout. That's this thing of being damaged and needing healing. Frodo is saying, I can't get the healing I need here. You can, Sam. You have so much to enjoy and to be and to do, Sam. But I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire too for years and years after all you have done. What is not included in Sam's statement? After all you have done to save it. Frodo, so I thought too once. But I've been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire and it has been saved. Notice there. I tried to save the Shire, I the agent, and it has been saved. Passive tense. Who has saved the Shire? Frodo is saying, not necessarily me. Who completed the quest of the ring? Gollum? By himself? Nope. <coughs> because Frodo had to get the ring all the way to Mount Doom in order for Gollum to bite it off. How did Frodo get the ring to Mount Doom? Sam. How did they get to the edge of the Indian Mule? Gandalf, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Boromir, Merry, Pippin. In other words, it took the entire fellowship. Okay? Frodo's saying it's been saved. How? Through a group. <laughs> Nobody ever does something like this on a totally individual basis. We're going to see the same thing in the Harry Potter stories, by the way. Okay? Someone, um, it must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. Someone has to give them up, lose them, so that others may keep them. What did Baragon, for example, give up so that others may keep it? Remember, he disobeyed the Lord of Gondor, the steward of Gondor, when he went up to stop Denethor, from frying slash torching Faramir, so that when Aragorn becomes king, he tells Baragon, you disobeyed an order of the steward of Gondor. Notice what he says, I cannot do. I can't just merely throw that under the rug. Therefore, because you disobeyed a direct order, here's your punishment. You will serve the steward of Gondor in Athelion. So he can't live in Minas Tirith anymore, which is where he was raised and served all his life. But because he was faithful to Faramir, you will serve him for the rest of your life. That's his punishment. It is punishment of a sort, but he's like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm down with that. But you are my heir. All that I had and might have had, I leave <coughs> to you. Okay? So they go on to the Grey Havens. Who meets them there? Mary and Pippin. Why? So that Sam doesn't have to ride home alone. Gandalf sends word to them. And the novel ends. 1031. At last they rode over the downs and took the east road, and then Mary and Pippin rode on to Buckland. And already they were singing again as they went. But Sam turned to Bywater. And so came back up the hill as day was ending once more. And he went on... And there was yellow light. Why is it yellow? I don't know what other kind of light it would be in a hobbit home, since they don't have these horrific things. It's firelight. In other words, Rosie has a fire in the fireplace. It's inviting. It's warm. And fire within, and the evening meal was ready, which probably implies, as Sam is riding up the road, he can smell it. And he was expected. And Rose drew him in. Notice. That says what? Where is she? She's standing at the door. Waiting for him. She welcomes him into the house. It's not like she's just, you know, off doing something. And Sam comes marching in the door. She's looking for him. Waiting for him. And she drew him in and set him in his chair and put little Eleanor upon his lap. He draws a deep breath. 
What's that mean? It's relief. It's he's content. I'm back. This is Sam's ending of a happy story. The same kind of story he was talking about as they were making their way up Kirithon Gaul. He says, you know, some happy endings aren't what the people in the story would call the happy ending. And, and you don't want the people in that kind of story to know the end. But he said there are the other kinds. He gets the other kind. Frodo gets the first kind. You wouldn't want Frodo to know of this ending at the beginning. That he's got to leave Middle Earth forever. And never see Merry and Pippin again, for example. Okay? <coughs> the theme of the class is renunciation of power. Notice how Sam renounces power. Notice how Frodo fails at the very end. Okay? But there's a reason for it. A ring, Frodo, a, power, a ring of power that any mortal has for too long will what? It will take control of the wearer. Okay? We see Eowyn renounce power and control, the desire to be a queen. We see Aragorn renounce power multiple times, even though at the end he does take it. Why does he take it? Why does he become king? It's destiny. It's what he's born for. That is the rightful use of power. All right? In the Harry Potter stories, we get something different. We get, one, different kinds of power being represented, but we do also have the desire to wield power over others. You know, <coughs> the, the, um, what are going to be called the three unforgivable curses. Okay, so as we start Sorcerer Stone... We won't get through all of it today, but we'll get pretty close. How many of you know that how this began? The story of its creation. Okay? J.K. Rowling is on a train one day from Manchester to London. And at one moment on that train ride, she is a unwed mother. She had been wed when the baby was conceived, divorced by the time the baby was born. She was an unwed mother living on Scottish welfare, okay, unemployed, with really no prospects. Okay. And in one second, she has no idea of any of this. And another second, an idea pops into her mind of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that... His parents were murdered by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived, and this dark wizard is out to kill him. One second, that idea never exists. Another second, that idea does exist. Why her? Why J.K. Rowling? Why didn't one of you have this idea? Why didn't I have this idea? Where, where does that kind of literary inspiration come from? Nobody knows. Nobody knows how that occurs. Is it like, you know, ideas exist in bubbles in the ether, and you just have to go through the bubble, and it latch onto you? Because, here's kind of why I'm getting at that. She takes several years to write this. I mean, that happened in either 90 or 91, that idea. Okay? She starts writing these. And she starts writing the other books, taking notes for the other books, even before this one is published. Okay? This gets published, first published, in 1997. By 2007, when the seventh book is published, she goes from being penniless and on welfare to being what? A billionaire. A billionaire. The richest woman in the United Kingdom. Wealthier than the queen. Okay, that's wealthy. Okay. Why? Because she had an idea that nobody else had ever had. Okay. She writes this, and she sends it off to a publisher. She gets rejected. 
She sends it off to another publisher. She gets rejected. She keeps taking notes for the other books. In other words, she already knows there's going to be seven. She sends it off to another publisher. She gets rejected. You know how many rejection slips she got? No. <laughs> it's either 20 or 21. Publishers rejected it. She finally sends it off to Bloomsbury, famous publisher in England. And the acquisitions editor says, ah, what the hell, I'll take a shot at it. They agree to publish it. Small print run. Low print run, by the way. Last Thursday, September 22nd, was the 80th anniversary of the initial publication of The Hobbit. <coughs> 1,500 initial copies. If you were to try to buy one of those 1,500 copies today, you'd be paying, uh, I think last time I saw one up for sale, was over $100,000. I mean, hugely expensive. Okay? I'm pretty sure it's the 21st publisher she goes to. They accept it. Okay? Small print run, gets published, no advertising. None. And it starts selling. And kids love it. And so, you know, one kid gets the book, reads it, lends it to their friend, the friend reads it, gives it back, the friend, the original one, then hands it to somebody else, they read it, then they ask their parents to buy it. That's how it starts to sell. Okay? It, it's published or it's advertised <laughs> by word of mouth. Okay? So this one gets published in 97. The second book gets published, also word of mouth advertising, in 98. By 99, the books are starting to be talked about. Okay? I first heard of them, I think it was in spring of 99. I was on my way to work or on my way home. I can't remember which. And that was back when I listened to NPR. And I was listening to NPR, and they had on their London bureau chief, a guy named T.R. Reed, who's a journalist. And he was talking about this new series of books written by this um, single mother, as he put it, that, as he kind of described it, is kind of like the C.S. Lewis Narnia books, but it's not as dodgy, excuse me, it's not as stodgy and preachy as the Chronicles of Narnia. And I teach a course on the Inklings and Lewis, and I heard that and I thought, you know, the hell with you. <laughs> I'm never going to read this series of books. And one day, like three or four weeks later, I was at Sam's Club and they had the books out. Right? This is before book release parties. They just had them sitting there. And so I pick up the first one, and I start reading it, and I sit, stand there, and I read the first chapter. Because within about the first three or four pages, I'm hooked. Okay? I buy it, I read it overnight, I go back the next day, and I buy the next two. I mean, I, I was hooked that quickly. Because it's, it's not what T.R.E. essentially said. It is a lot like C.S. Lewis. And by the way, there's a reason there's seven of these. It's because there were seven Chronicles of Narnia rolling this <coughs> thing. She had, at one point, she had described Lewis as her favorite author. At other points, she says it's Jane Austen. So, you know, go figure. But she has said in a couple of interviews, if she went into a room, and a room had a copy of the Chronicles of Narnia, she could not stop herself from going in and picking up one of the Chronicles and just starting reading. Okay. It was... It had kind of that effect on it. Okay? So, first, second, third. Fourth book is not published in 2000. Or is it? Yes, it is. Fourth book, I think, is published in... Uh, <coughs> yeah, I think it is 2000. And then the fifth is in 2003. The sixth is in 2005, and the seventh is in 2000. It's either 2000 or, yeah, I'm almost positive it's 2000. Um, so you get a gap, pretty good gap, 
between here and here. Okay? It's with this book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, that you get the midnight release parties. Okay? It's with this book that you first get pre-sales on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I think this book had something like 8 million copies sold before you could physically even hold the book. Okay? And in each one of these upped it. Okay? When this book came out, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And I think they were two, three, four. When this book came out, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Between number five and number six, the New York Times created a different bestseller list so that J.K. Rowling would not be number one. And they did that because the literary geniuses at the New York Times said, <coughs> a book of children's fiction should not be number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Only, as one of my colleagues would say, only serious fiction should be number one. Okay. So, for this book and this book, you had the New York Times bestseller list of children's literature. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. When these came out, all seven of them were in the top seven. Okay. She has, I think this is pretty current, as of today, sold over... 450 million copies. So, but other than the Bible, it's the best-selling book in history. Okay. Lord of the Rings, over 250 million. But the Lord of the Rings has had over 50 years. 60 years now. How many of these, how many of these will be sold in another 50 years? Okay. Probably an awful lot. Especially if she's smart, which I'm not sure that she is, and comes out with a second edition and revises a lot of the problems that are in all seven of these books. Okay? She's not the meticulous author that Tolkien is. She is a great storyteller. She is somebody you'd want to sit around a campfire and say, so Joe, tell us a story. And she would just have you in rapt attention. Tolkien's the kind of person who makes sure every little loose end is wrapped up. Or, if it's not wrapped up, it is so buried or lost, you can't find it. Okay. He says in his introduction, there are problems with it, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Readers have found problems. Now, Rowley tries to explain those away as not being problems in Pottermore and things like that. We'll see how well she does, because I'm going to point them out. So, this exists in a tradition, okay? And the tradition is the, um, what do I want to call it? The, the schoolboy story. That is, the kind of fiction where you have somebody go off to school and you read about their adventures slash experiences there. There. It goes back to um, uh, completely blanking out on the name. Tom Brown's school days. Thomas Arnold, I think, in the mid 1850s or so. Okay, but you have a whole series of works kind of along the same lines. The difference, obviously, is this is a work of fantasy. How do you know? Well. People don't fly on brooms, <laughs> first of all. And I know there are there is now actually a Quidditch league. People are so stupid. Quidditch, you know, league where people play, schools play. I mean, there are colleges with Quidditch teams the whole nine yards. Okay? I don't think she necessarily intends that when it begins. So you begin with. And I'm going to start with the first chapter. I'm going to skip a bunch. This is what initially hooked me. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Purdue Drive, are proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. In other words, 
that thank you very much is so quintessentially British. Right? But what are we told? They are, they think, normal. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything. What? Two words. Strange or mysterious. So, strange and mysterious do not equal normal. Right? If they consider themselves perfectly normal, perfectly meaning the quintessence of normality, and they don't hold with either of these two things, then these two things must be abnormal. Okay? For you young Frankenstein fans. So, what happens? Their lives get turned upside down by this guy who deposits a baby on their doorstep one morning. The baby is somebody they know or know of. How often have they seen this child? <laughs> Even when we get to the end of book seven, how often do we know that they had seen Harry? We don't. <laughs> We do know by the end of book seven, there had been contact between the Potters and the Dursleys. But in here, it doesn't sound like they have much contact. Why? So how do you know that you're immediately not in Kansas, so to speak? Page eight. This man appears on the corner that the cat's been sitting on. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. You don't see many men with hair long enough or beard long enough to tuck into a belt. Okay. Slightly eccentric, let's say. He was wearing long robes, purple cloak that swept the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. Doesn't mean he's wearing stilettos. Though with Dumbledore, you, you can't necessarily do it. <coughs> His blue eyes were light, bright, sparkling behind half-moon spectacles. His nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. And what does he do? He pulls the thing out of his pocket and he goes, flick, 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 12 times, and the street lights all go out. That immediately tells you, hmm, something a little bit different. Okay. And so we hear Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall talk about Voldemort, or Voldemort, if you want, and the Potters. Why does his name mean fly or flee from death? Okay. What does Albus Dumbledore mean? Albus, white. Dumbledore is the old English word for bumblebee. The white bumblebee. What the hell does that mean? Right? Minerva, goddess of wisdom. Okay? And McGonagall is just a Scottish name. So, what does she say about Dumbledore and Voldemort? Dumbledore says, I, you know, I don't have powers like he has. She says, you're too noble to use them. And he blushes. So, he gets ready to drop off, Harry. On page 13, when page 12, she says, you know, why couldn't he kill Harry? Dumbledore, well, we may never know. Liar. Page 13, <laughs> he says, I'm going to leave a letter with the Dursleys to help explain about this kid. And she says, a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known. It's Harry Potter Day in the future. What day is it? It's November 1st. Okay. 1031 is when Harry's parents are killed. Any guesses as to what important day November 1st is in the quote-unquote Christian calendar? It's All Saints Day. 
on All Hallows Day. This is All Hallows Eve, Halloween. Okay. So she says, I won't be surprised if this day in the future is called Harry Potter Day. Well, later on in the series, Harry is going to be called what? By Draco Malfoy. He's going to call him Saint Potter. Okay. And Harry is going to be referred to in a later book as a Patronus. <coughs> okay. A protector, a defender, a savior. So, Harry gets dumped with the Dursleys. And what happens? He gets raised by them. And the book really begins, let's say, as we get closer and closer to Harry's 11th birthday. In other words, 10 years go by. And he starts getting these strange letters. How are the letters delivered? What are some of the ways the letters are delivered? Owl? Post? Owls come down the chimney. Owls come through the windows. Letters get fed underneath the door, through the sides of the door. Letters get delivered. Yeah. Inside eggs that are delivered by the milkman in the morning. Okay. Inside the egg. So you crack an egg to make a scrambled egg. And there's a letter. All folded up. You know, you open it and it magically kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What should that tell the Dursleys? There's no escaping this. And what does Vernon Dursley do? He tries as hard as he can. He nails all the doors and windows closed. He, you know, puts something over the fireplace. It's the letters coming in the eggs. That's the final straw. So they leave the house. They go off to a hotel. A hundred letters are delivered there that night. He leaves. They leave. He goes off. He buys something in a long package. They go off. They park in the middle of a meadow. And Dudley's like, Daddy's lost his marbles, hasn't he, Mommy? Daddy's lost his marbles. And she's like, okay. So where do they finally go? Yeah, they go to, well, what, is it, what does it say? It says, where is the letter addressed? Um, page 51, Mr. H. Potter, the floor, hut on the rock, the sea. Okay. <laughs> After they go out to this rock, the parents, Vernon and Petunia, sleep in a little room. Dudley sleeps on the broken down couch in the night, and Harry curls up next to the non-existent fire by the fireplace. And he sees Dudley's hand hanging down over the edge of the couch, and he counts away to midnight because that will be his 11th birthday. What day? July 31st, why that day? It's Roland's birthday. Okay. And when the watch ticks off at 12.01, bam, the door gets burst open. And we meet Hagrid, keeper of the keys. I'm skipping a bunch. And Hagrid finds out, pages 48, 49, Harry doesn't know anything. Okay. Harry says, you know, I, I know some stuff. I mean, I can do math. You know, I'm not a complete idiot. And Hagrid says, page 50, but our world, I mean, your world, my world, your parents' world. What? Dursley, you must know about your mom and dad. I mean, they're famous. You're famous. They weren't famous. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know what you are. Vernon says, stop right there. He's never going to know. What does he say? We said when we took him in, we'd stamp that nonsense out of him. So Vernon says something bad about Albus Dumbledore. Hagrid doesn't take that lightly. Top of 51. Harry, I'm a what? 
A wizard, of course. And a thumping good one, I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit. With a mom and dad like yours, what else would you be? And I reckon it's about time, and he hands him the letter. Okay? He goes on, talks about muggles. The Dursleys are muggles. What does a muggle mean? Non-magical. Okay? She doesn't invent the word, by the way. There's a street in London, Shakespeare lived on it, called Monkwell. But in Shakespeare's day, that word is pronounced muggle. We just don't pronounce the mm, and this gets muggle, okay? Because the W is silent. Vernon. 53. We swore when we took him in, we put a stop to that rubbish. Swore we'd stamp it out of it. You knew, Harris said. You knew I'm a wizard. Of course we knew, Aunt Petunia goes berserk. <laughs> How could you not be my dratted sister being what she was? Oh, she got a letter just like that. Blah, 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 blah. Lily this, Lily that. You're a freak. Mm -hmm. Then she met that potter at school. They looked, got married, had you. And of course, you know, strange, abnormal. Car crash. Okay? So, Hagrid tells Harry about Voldemort, and Vernon says, 56, I know there's something strange about you. Probably good beating wouldn't have cured. Parents got, you know, some sticky end. He calls Dumbledore, crackpot. Hagrid curses him, hits Dudley instead, gives him a pig's tail. And he takes Dudley, he takes Harry off the next morning <coughs> to Diagon Alley, which, if you say really fast, <coughs> becomes diagonally. Why is it diagonally? It can't be seen head on. This is one of the brilliant things Rowling does here. The wizards exist, kind of, right? kind of, in just a different perspective. See, we're told muggles can't see them. Why? Because they don't look properly. They don't see properly. Okay? If they did, they would see them. Now, the morning that Harry gets dropped off at the Dursleys, what does Vernon see outside? Weirdos. Freaks. Why? Because there are people congregating on street corners in capes and cloaks. Happens all the time today, but, you know, it's a different world now, okay? He hears people talking about Potter, but he doesn't recognize them for what they are. He just thinks they're what? <coughs> Freaks and weirdos, okay? So, Hagrid has to take Harry off to Diagon Alley in order to get his school stuff. Harry's thinking, okay, like, what kind of school stuff? So he's got to get a cauldron. He's got to get potions, Okay? Hagrid's going to buy him a, what? An owl, because owls are cool, better than cats and toads. He goes to Gringotts Bank, and notice what Gringotts has inscribed over the door. Page 72. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned. Beware of finding more than treasure here. Okay? So they go down, uh, skipping a bunch, and Hagrid has to get something out of the vaults, Vault 753, and he takes Harry to his vault, and what does Harry discover? He's loaded. <laughs> How much has Harry ever gotten from the Dursleys? Ten years of being raised by them. How's he treated by them? Horribly. Is he physically abused? Do they beat him? Well, Dudley does, but the Vernon doesn't, and Petunia don't. Is he neglected? Yes. Okay. And now he discovers he's wealthier than they are. Okay. So Henry gets him his money that he'll need for the school year, and they start to go off. They go off, and they get Harry his wand. He meets Ollivander, and what does Ollivander say repeatedly? The wand does what? 
The wand chooses the wizard. And we could almost go straight to the end of book seven. Right? Well, how do we know the wand chooses Harry? Because he's sitting there doing this with wands, and they're not doing anything. And he does it with one, and red and gold sparks fly out. <coughs> and page 85, Ollivander says, curious, curious. Harry, what's curious? I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter, every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather in your wand gave another feather. Just one other. Very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. Yes, 13 and a half inches. You. Okay. So the scar that gave Harry the, uh, the, scar that gave Harry the wand. The one that gave Harry the scar was you and Phoenix Feather. Harry's wand is what? Holly. Holly and Phoenix Feather. Okay? These are going to be important. Really important later on. In terms of symbolism, okay? Does anybody know anything about you? It's a great wood for making bows, okay, for archery. It's also poisonous. The leaves are poisonous, okay? There's only one animal, however, that can eat yew leaves, and it's deer, okay? What about holly? What does a holly leaf look like? Like that. Might not be that exact number of points, but it has thorns. What do holly bushes slash trees produce in the winter? Red berries. Red berries, okay? So you've got thorns, and the leaves are kind of shaped like a crown. See where I'm going? And you have red berries, okay? This is symbolism in the Middle Ages, where the holly was taken to be symbolic of crown of thorns, and the berries, the blood. Okay. What else about holly? Holly isn't like oak or maple. In that it's an evergreen. Hollies don't shed their leaves. So it's evergreen and it has Christian symbolism. Well, evergreen also implies what? Not dying. So Harry's wand has several quote-unquote Christ symbols, and then it has what in it? Phoenix feather. If you were to go, I'm planning on doing a Shakespeare course, I'm going to try to do a Shakespeare course in London in summer of 2019, <coughs> and if I do, we'll go to Stratford. If you go to the Trinity Church in Stratford, where Shakespeare is buried, on the altar, or at least it was there several years ago, on the altar is an <coughs> altar cloth. And the altar cloth was this magnificent embroidery, this huge phoenix. Why would you put a phoenix on a Christian altar? Resurrection. Because what does the phoenix do? It dies, and then it rises. Okay? But then why would this one have a phoenix? To flee from death? See, the phoenix doesn't stay dead. <laughs> Voldemort, whose wand is this, wants to overcome death permanently. All right? So, here he gets his other stuff. And we get the journey from platform nine and three quarters. He doesn't know how to get through the platform. He overhears a family. He <laughs> kind of goes up to Mrs. Weasley. She says, you know, first time, follow me. They lead them through. And Harry gets on the train and makes a new friend. Who's his new friend? How many friends has Harry had before? Seemingly none. Okay. How come he and Ron hit it off so well? Louder? Okay, he gave Ron food. Is that the only reason? Is Ron just famished? Here. 
Yeah, Ron's the youngest son. How many children are there in Ron's family? Seven. Okay. He's the sixth born. He's a first year. And he's a first year. Those of you who come from large families, I'm the youngest of five, what does that usually mean? Hand-me-downs. What kind of hand-me-downs does Ron have? He's got a hand-me-down wand. He's going to get hand-me-down robes. In uh, the fourth book, that looked like girls' robes, you know. Okay? His family is poor. Harry's family isn't poor, but Harry has been poor. Okay? What else? Harry doesn't know anything about the place he's going to, right? I mean, we didn't talk about it. Madame Malcolm's robe. He meets another student. And that student says, I don't think they should let the other kind in, do you? And Harry's like, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? That's our first introduction to Draco Malfoy. We'll meet him again in just a moment. So Draco Malfoy comes in and says, it's you, it's Harry Potter, is it? And what does he offer Harry? Friendship. What does he say his friendship will bring? Or what does he imply it will bring? It will open doors. He says, <coughs> essentially, you don't want to go hanging around with riffraff like the Weasleys. Okay? He says, I can help you there. I mean, Malfoy, Harry doesn't know this, but Ron does. Malfoy is what kind of name? It's powerful. It's powerful. Carries a lot of weight. What does it mean? Comes from French malfoy. Mal, like maladjusted. Bad. Foi. Bad faith. Draco. Dragon. <coughs> bad faith is what his name literally means. It's not, however, bad faith as in put your faith in the Malfoys and that's bad faith. It's bad faith in whom the Malfoys place their faith. Okay. What's his father's name? Lucius. Lucius. What does that mean? White. What is Satan's real name? Lucifer. Lucifer. What does that mean? It's a great name. I mean, it is a beautiful name to name a child. The only problem is it's got this one little antecedent that kind of spoils it for everybody else. It means bearer of light. You know, which is kind of interesting because a couple of years ago, Time Magazine or Newsweek, I think maybe it's 2012 after Obama was reelected. They called him the, bear, the light bearer. <laughs> I bet they didn't have a clue if they knew what that word meant in uh, Latin. Okay? It means bearer of light, though. So Lucius means light. How enlightened is he? We'll see. So he goes off to school, and we have the sorting hat. What does the sorting hat do <coughs> when it gets popped onto... Harry, page 121. I know we've only got a minute left. Yeah, hmm, says the hat. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. It's interesting. You wouldn't think because he's been beaten up so much by Dudley. Not a bad mind either. Now, that's not a ringing endorsement for one's intellect. Not a bad mind. <laughs> There's talent. Oh, my goodness, yes. And a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now, that's interesting. Where shall I put you? Harry, not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Why does he say not Slytherin? One, Malfoy. And two, because that's what Hagrid told him pretty much all the dark wizards came out of. He doesn't know to think uh, Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw. Or he doesn't say, Gryffindor, please let it be Gryffindor. He just says, not Slytherin. In other words, any place else. <laughs> Not Slytherin? You sure? It, 
You could be great, you know. It's all here. Slytherin will help you. Okay. Better be Gryffindor then. All right. We'll stop there. and We'll pick up there. We'll go through this probably in the next half hour to 45 minutes. So have Chamber of Secrets ready for Thursday.